Hey guys, in this lesson, let's focus on the t-test. Specifically, we'll go over one simple t-test. T-test is one of the top topics asked in statistics interviews. So it's really important to have very good understanding of t-test before your interviews so that you can ask interview questions related to t-test. Let's start with looking at some interview questions. What are the differences between the t-test and the z-test? What are the assumptions of the t-test? In this lesson, we'll focus on the fundamentals of t-test. We'll look at the difference between the t-test and the z-test, assumptions of the t-test, and we will look at the test statistic of t-tests. And finally, we'll go over using the t-test for one simple mean. In the next lesson, we will talk about t-tests for two simple means, which is more complicated, and that built on top of what we will learn in this lesson. So let's dive right into What's the difference between t-tests and z-tests? All right, first of all, let's look at the difference between the t-tests and the z-tests. We learned from the previous lesson that the z-test is used to test the mean proportion of a population against a number or against the mean proportion of another population, as long as some basic assumptions are satisfied. So what are these assumptions? The data are normally distributed with known variance or a large enough sample that we could invoke some well-known theorem, such as the central limit theorem or the Slutsky theorem, to obtain a normally distributed test statistic. So the key is that the test statistic is normally distributed. When I say large enough samples, it means that we have at least 30 sample points, and in that case, there's no need to assume normality, as the central limit theorem implies that you can use a z-test for both cases. So for large sample sizes, the t-test procedure gives almost identical p-values as the z-test procedure. The t-test can be replaced by a z-test if we have over 30 samples and we know the variance of the population. And also the data is not highly skewed. Similar to the z-test, t-test also has one sample and two sample tests. Okay, let's move on to the assumptions of the t-test. The t-test accomplishes the same goal as the z-test, but under a complementary set of assumptions. The sample size is not too large, usually less than 30, and the population variance is unknown, which is almost always the case in applications. Finally, the data is normally distributed. Even though we can relax this assumption slightly by requiring only that the sample mean be normally distributed and the sample variance be chi-squared distributed and independent of the sample mean. There's an important note here. We should not use the t-test if the sample contains outliers as that may mean some of the required assumptions like normality are in fact violated. So these are the three assumptions of the t-test. Now let's move on to the t-statistic. To use the t-test, the test statistic t equals sample mean minus mu zero over sample standard deviation. From the previous lesson, you can tell that this form is the same as a z-test. Here, mu zero is a constant or the sample mean of a second population to which we would like to compare our population mean. If the assumptions for the t-test are satisfied, then the test statistic, the t-statistic, follows the student t-distribution. What is a student t-distribution? Let's compare it with the z-distribution so that you can understand what it is. Here's a diagram showing three curves. The blue curve is the z-distribution or standard normal curve. The red curve and the green curve, both of them are t-distribution, but they have different sample sizes. The dependence of the t-distribution on the sample size n is via its only parameter, which we call degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is the number of pieces of information that can freely vary without violating any given restrictions. That is, the number of independent pieces of information available to estimate another piece of information. It's a number of independent input minus the number of intermediate input. If this sounds too abstract, let me give you an example. The sample variance of n data points in the denominator of the test statistic depends on the sample mean, right? So we have n minus 1 degrees of freedom. 
n is the sample size, 1 means the sample mean is restricted. So the test statistic has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Once we understand the degrees of freedom, let's go back to this diagram. So from this diagram, we can see that the shape of the t-distribution differs for sample size much smaller than 30, which is a green curve, compared to sample size close to 30. The one with less sample points has heavier tails. And if we compare the t-distribution with the z-distribution, we can see that the t-distribution has heavier tails than the normal distribution. As the sample size n increases, the t-distribution better approximates the normal distribution. For a large number of sample points, more than 30, the t-distribution and the normal distribution become almost identical, even though it's not shown on this diagram, but that's just a fact that the t-distribution approximates the standard normal curve once we have more sample points. All right, now we know the difference between the t-distribution and the z-distribution. Let's look at the t-test for one sample mean. We use the t-test for one sample mean when we want to estimate the population mean from a small random sample with less than 30 data points. Here are the two hypotheses. The non-hypothesis is that mu, the population mean, is the same as mu zero. And the alternative hypothesis is that mu is not the same as mu zero. Now let's look at the test statistic. We can construct our t statistic and under the null hypothesis, the test statistic is the sample mean minus mu zero over s over square root of n. x bar is the sample mean, mu zero is a constant we want to compare our population mean against. And s is the sample standard deviation. s is the square root of the sum of xi minus x bar squared over n minus 1. As some of you may know, s squared is an unbiased estimator of the population variance. Under the null hypothesis, we know that the test statistic follows a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now let's look at the critical t-value for two-sided test. Let's say we set the significance level alpha. We define t n minus 1 alpha over 2, the positive real number to the left of which an observed t n minus 1 random variable falls with probability. Probability, the test statistic larger than t n minus 1 alpha over 2 is alpha over 2. And the probability that the test statistic is less than negative t n minus 1 alpha over 2 is also alpha over 2. So this diagram summarizes this nicely. So we can see that the distribution is symmetric and on either side, if the test statistic is larger than the critical t-value, the area is alpha over 2. Okay, now let's look at an example to see how to use the t-test for one sample mean. Let's say we want to estimate the average height of women in the US. We randomly sampled 10 women. We guess the true value is around 160 centimeters. Here's how we can use Python to run the t-test. So we know the total number of sample points is 10, and here we use sigma 2.1 and the population mean 162 to sample 10 points from this population. Of course, we don't have access to these two parameters, otherwise there's no need to conduct the hypothesis test, right? So our hypothesis, our null hypothesis specifically, is mu zero is 160. So we can calculate our observed t-score, which is x bar minus mu zero over sample standard deviation over square root of n. We compare the observed t-score with the critical t-score. And in this case, these two are pretty close to each other, but the observed t-score is slightly larger than the critical t-score. So we land in the rejection region, we reject our null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. And our conclusion is that the height is likely different from 160 centimeters. Finally, let's look at how to derive small sample counts interval for a population mean. Because the test statistic follows a t-distribution, we can get a 1 minus alpha, 100% countless interval for the population mean. Mu is x bar plus or minus 
tn minus 1 alpha over 2 s over square root of n. If the sample size is large enough, we can instead use x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 s over square root of n. So we replace the t critical value with the z critical value if we have enough sample size. So continue using our previous example to estimate the height of women in the US, we can calculate the margin of error, which is the critical t-score multiplied by the sample standard deviation over square root of n. And then we can obtain the lower bound of the confidence interval, which is the point estimate, the sample mean minus margin of error, and the upper bound is the sample mean plus margin of error. So finally, we can obtain the confidence interval of the height of women. All right, that's it for this lesson. In this lesson, we went over the difference between t-test and z-test, assumptions of t-test, and we also talked about the test statistic of t-test. Finally, we look at how to use the t-test for one sample mean. In the next lesson, we will look at using the t-test for two sample means, which is a more complicated situation. But with the fundamental knowledge we learned in this lesson, we are good to go for the next lesson. I see you in the next one.